Hello and welcome to the swim brief. Oh, Megan, I totally forgot to ask how to pronounce your last name before we started recording. That was the one thing I was supposed to do. Help me out here. Megan Esting. Esting. Oh, yeah. I was going to go for Osting, but Esting. Yes. Fair choice. Fair choice. Yeah. <laughs> um, so good to have you. You are the uh, what's what's your correct title at, at Swim Mac? You're the head swim coach. Head yeah. Coach. And you've just started in that position here in November. Uh, you've made a move in the pandemic uh, across uh, the United States. Uh, how has that been? Uh, it's, it's turbulent. It's been turbulent. Yeah. I actually started, um, I, got, I, I, I got the offer on the like 30th and started on the first. So oh my gosh. I threw down, I think maybe on the second for a week and then came back and then was two places at once for a while. And I actually moved over Thanksgiving physically myself and my family's been coming in pieces and my stuff's been coming in boxes. <laughs> wow. I wouldn't recommend this to anyone. <laughs> no, moving always sucks. Uh, but moving during the pandemic sounds like it sucks more and moving in the span of a couple of days sounds even worse than that so yeah. Yeah. at least you didn't leave the country you know that, i guess that's the only way we could make it worse yeah um, it was driving distance uh, on yeah. the way down i got to stay with my college roommate and so that made in nashville so that made it a little bit more relaxing and i kind of ground with some friends and uh and that, that actually helped the transition great um, I want to ask you some biographical questions. And as I said before we recorded this, I was scanning uh, your bio at your, your previous job, Eastern Iowa uh, Swimming Federation. Uh, it says you grew up in uh, Seattle, Washington area. Um, and you actually represented the U.S. Uh, as a teenager at the Pan American Games. Um, talk a little bit about what it was like uh, for you, because like I, I could gather you got to travel to some pretty exotic locales representing the U.S. Yeah, I did. Um, so I, I wish I had known more as a teenager uh, about what was going on. So my my national junior team trip, we were actually the first team into East Berlin after the wall came down. Wow. So uh, we were we were in the wall, like we have pieces of the wall. We were we were touching that, and I mean what that's. That's amazing. Um, we were in Paris for that trip and we, we got to have dinner in the Eiffel Tower, which was really cool. And my trip to the Pan Ams was actually in Cuba and Fidel Castro gave out our medals one night. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so, <laughs> and I'm a child, like I don't, I don't know what's going on around me. And looking back, swimming, swimming has given me so much socially, with relationships, um, the context of growing up, but e even these historical moments that I got to have through swimming. I mean, who shakes Fidel Castro's hand? Right. Climbs inside the Berlin Wall like it's some sort of playground, you know? So, yeah, yeah it, I, I had a really rich age groups and senior swimming experience with all the support that, that you could ever want. And, and I think that's part of what brought me into coaching was I was given so much in so many different areas that being a part of creating opportunities for these kids is, I mean, it, it, if I could give somebody or facilitate somebody getting half of what I got in my life and, and the launching of, of life through swimming, I would feel like a superhero. I'd feel great. That's what I want to do. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel, I feel very lucky that, um, uh... I got to, especially when I was coaching in Denmark, I coached there for four years and uh, got to travel quite a bit. And then by that point, uh, I was, you know, enough of an adult that I was very conscious about like, okay, if I'm going to go to this place, I'm not just going to be at the hotel pool. I have to have some kind of cultural experience on the side of it. And uh, there's just such great memories for that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, I, I don't know, maybe when the, when, when we're, really able to travel again. There, there may be a resurgence of that, of thinking like, okay, we're really lucky to be able to get on a plane and go to this far away location to have our swim meet. Maybe we'll do a little bit more than um, 
than just sort of like shuttle back and forth, you know? Um, I don't know what you think. I think for me, swimming is so much bigger than going to practice and yeah. training. I mean, there's the, there's the social stuff there, but you know, these, the, the kids that miss their, their opportunities to, to, to do those sorts of things. Um, I think they got a different level of richness that, that, that we wouldn't have had if we had to stop and actually look at what was going on. Mm -hmm. and we just rolled through as if it was an expectation, as if we were like, of course, I made the junior team, so I get to travel to Europe at 16. Well, do you get that? I mean, <laughs> so I think these kids got a different gift. You know, they got to pull out and have perspective on how important, how, 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 how blessed they are to have these opportunities. And, and I think that can go even farther. So maybe, maybe the kids that, that went through this summer without that are going to be more mature on the other side and, and can have that richness. Whereas, you know, when they make the panning games a year later and they're, you know, having these historical experiences, I bet they're really going to appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, so you, you go on to swim at UCLA. Uh, at, at what point do you decide you want to be a swim coach? Like, how does that come to be? Uh, you know, that actually happened when I was like, I, I both did and didn't want to become a swim coach. Okay. So when I was 14. Um, yeah, 14. I would always, we didn't have like a dry land program or anything. Like nobody knew anything really about that side. So. Yeah, it was like push ups and sit ups in those oh days. Oh, yeah, that's exactly what I did. I just did push ups yeah. and sit ups. So I would, that, that's literally what my dry land program was. And I didn't, it was so barbaric, but I just knew for me, the things that made me good at swimming were the, my consciousness of what I was doing, um, my touch for the water and my strength. Like I was silly strong. And, and so I thought, well, if I want to be better then I'll just be stronger. Like, I mean, I'm just like 14. I don't know what I'm doing. So I would come to practice early and do a lot of pushups. Like, I think I got up to like 10 sets of 40 pushups and tens, yeah. And 10 sets of 60 sit-ups or something. I'd just go back and forth. And so it, I would get there like an hour early in the spring of my freshman year, they were having this little kid pre summer league clinic. And one of my teammates who was a senior was coaching the six and unders. And that was, I was over there like doing pushups and she was coaching the six and unders. And I was like, I, that looks like fun. I'm going to go do that. And so I asked her, her name's Jan Hurst. And I asked her if I could help out with the little littles that we would need to go to the shallow end and, so from that point on, I started doing the, the babies and then I started teaching them private lessons. And I was really like, I would go to morning practice and then come and give a private lesson at the pool at a different pool and then go to school when I was in high school. And I, I just, I loved it. I loved the relationship. I loved giving swimming. Um, I, I, I love the technical side of it. And so I started really getting into coaching as, as a 14, 15 year old. Now in college, I got my first assistant senior coaching job. That was my fifth year. And I was coaching for a friend of my coach, Jack Ridley. I was coaching for Mike Sheridan at Canantini. And, um, and that's when my eyes kind of opened up to the bigger picture of coaching. Like it's, it's not all little kids and, and summer fun and all, all that stuff. Um, and that I remember he asked me one time, what makes an elite swimmer? And I listed like all these, like he really made me think, I'm so thankful for that time with him. What a great question to ask your uh, assistant funny. senior coach has just started. <laughs> yeah, what makes an elite swimmer? And yeah. so I, like I was always been like a, a good kid, like I'm trying to be a good kid. And so, yeah. Um, I listed all these coachability things, you know, that, like they listen, they're aware, they're, you know, they're consciously, they take feedback well, they're humil humility is, is a priority. Um, and he looked at me and just laughed, you know, no. <laughs> uh -oh. I didn't know what I didn't know. And, right. and so the world of swimming got a, a lot broader. And I, I took my first, I coached at the Sanford camp that summer with Richard Crick and Skip Kenny. 
and an awesome staff. And I, one of my memories from that time is Richard, well, Skip's Sunshine Talk. I don't know if you've ever heard nope, that. I'm not familiar with it. It's like the basis of his culture. It's, it's, it's connecting, leading, lifting people up around you to hear Skip give that talk every Thursday afternoon for seven weeks. I took so many notes and my notes were different every time. And so from Skip, I learned really the basis of culture. Mm -hmm. Richard would go to the end of every lane. And as the, you know how there's like 15 kids in a short sure. course and they're just popping. Yeah. He would move his chair from lane to lane. Every time someone, they had the name on the front of their cap. And every time someone would come in, he'd say their name, highlight something good, highlight a place to get better. 14 times. It, three seconds apart, three seconds apart, next lane, three seconds apart, three seconds. And I was like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> he is, he's working hard. Yeah. And, and that kind of brought me to like, you, you can't just stand there. You, you got to work out there. What is, what is the work of a good deck coach? What does that look like? You got to pay attention. You got to process, you got to fire it back in a way that can connect. So like land it, land it, land it, land it. And he, and he would do this like 75 times. And then he would start over. And I, I, I mean, I was, I was so impressed by that. And I coached um, in Northern California for a year. And then I coached in South Bend for a year. And in South Bend, I realized what a bad coach I was. I mean, I was just, I was. What did, was, was I, what did you think was bad? What did you think was bad? My, I wasn't organized in the way that I needed to be. And I, I was moderately organized, but the level of keeping track of that many balls in me, I was a head coach. Ah, the first head coaching position. My, yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. You just realize how much you don't know. So it was the organization. It was, um, I'm going to say like holding my ground with the parents, but it was not in a, um, I don't think that's an adversarial situation with parents. No. I don't. It can it can become one, right? It it, one. If, if you don't, uh, if you're not organized, as you say, if you don't like, uh, you're not very thoughtful about how you go through it, can very quickly become one. And I'm, I'm just shaking my head too, because <laughs> I have the exact same reflection on my first head coach. I mean, I'm back to being, I'm back to being a minion. And it's yeah. so nice to have this little world you know, where I can get everything done in this little world. And instead yeah. of the head coach where you're just like, you know, just the, everything is spreading out in front of you. You really have to be on top of it. You, you need to deliver and you need to govern your product. So to me, um, when, when, when you're a head coach and you're not delivering the product that your customers are happy with and they let you know, you either better be able to fix the product or, um, or, or you're just going to keep having those conversations. Like yeah. you have to level up. And if you're not okay with hearing where you need to level up, being a head coach is not for you because right. you're going to hear it. And, 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 you, and you're probably needing to level up in the head. They're giving you feedback. It's actually a really good thing. I, I would say the times that I, really made the most progress were the times where I got feedback on where I needed to improve. So if, if you can't hear that, if you're not in a place where you can, where you have the confidence to know that, that if I need to improve in something, I know where to get that information. I know how to re-systemize my own stuff and I know how to come back better. I'd say that's actually the skill set of being a head coach is, yeah. Because you're not going to do everything really, really well. You're, you're going to, and you're going to drop the ball even on things that you normally do really well. So if you can't regroup and level up, then head coaching is going to be really hard. And it, to me, it's the ability to, to, to gather up, restructure, and then bring it back and do that cycle again and again and again and again. I mean, really, I'm, ne I'm never going to have a PhD in, in physiology, sociology, psychology, biomechanics, um, physics, yeah. uh, systems, organization. I mean, you are never going to nail this 
across the board in all the components that, that you would need, all the PhDs that you would need. Knowing that you're never gonna have that, I think you just have to lead with your values and, and kind of succumb to the fact that you're never gonna be, it's, it's never gonna be perfect. And someone's gonna give you feedback. You've got all these eyes on you and someone's gonna give you feedback in the areas that you're not perfect. And you're not gonna be. So try again. I, one, of, one of the things I wanna ask you about in that is who, who was it that, you know, or what group of people was it that you called, you know, when you were like realizing, oh man, I'm struggling and I need to get better. Because I, if I look back at, at, at my uh, first head coaching job, um, one of the things, there, there are a number of factors that I think uh, led it to not go as well as it could. I mean, one, one was just, uh, it's insane. I mean, it was in another country, like trying to learn uh, all these systems of another country and be in charge of um, all sorts of people. And I, I never really truly got on top of that. I also felt like in my own coaching career, like I, I had been chasing like jobs that, that looked good, but I hadn't, I didn't have like mentors from, from my work life that I could call up and be like, oh, I'm really having a hard time. Like, what do I do? Um, do so I'm assuming you had people like that. Who, who were those people for you? Or maybe you didn't, <laughs> <laughs> judging by your face. <laughs> Um, I, uh, I would say both a strength and weakness of mine is that when I'm not doing well, I turn inside mm -hmm. and I, and Same. I, yeah, I think we're, based on what you just said, I think that we're a lot alike. Yeah. Um, I think it can be a strength in that it, it is, it is a genuine, it is an honest, genuine look inside of of, um, hey, you need to be better. Right. And, and I'm not sure a lot of people can really have that moment of, uh, I mean, there is a depth of humility that I, I, I so know that I'm not anywhere near perfect. I, I know I have so many places to level up, but a lot of people say that like, oh, we can always get better. <laughs> but wait, when you fail against your own standards mm. and you have to have, you have to have a, you have to sit with that. Um, oof, there's depth there. There's emotional depth to that. I don't like that. And when I go inside, that is, that's very real for me. And, um, and it, that process can bring you uh, to a very rich place as you come out of it. But it would be so much easier just to ask somebody. But I, you know, I don't think you can you can go either or. I don't think you can just turn inside. I think you need to ask for help. But I don't think you can just ask for help and not have a moment where you have to legitimately come to terms with what you're not doing well. And some of those might the hardest times that I've had to have that moment with myself is when I failed people, whether they're. Um, coaches that I would want to honor and I haven't done a good job with that or um, kids that are not ha not having the experience that I want to give them. So if I speak harshly to a kid or where I, um, okay, so I'm going to tell you when I started drinking coffee. <laughs> okay. I'm, gonna... I'm, I'm going to follow, but yeah, I'm, I'll okay. go down that road with you. So I never, I, I didn't drink coffee. I don't, I'm like, I don't know. Maybe it's just like my athletic background or, or whatever, but like, I want to feel, I have to feel good in my body in order to do well with my, my action. So, um, so I just never wanted that tainted. So I never drank coffee because I just wanted it to be pure. I don't know. And so um, I was at an age group championship meet four years ago. It was like day three. It was like the, the morning session after the 10 unders and the, finals and prelims and the relays and it's 10 o'clock at night and it's six o'clock in the morning and I think I showed up on the third day and I was talking to swimmers not great 
and my face wasn't great. My, my attitude wasn't, I was tired. I was really tired. And, and I was just tired. trying to grind through it. Oh, like, God, I was just trying to grind through it. Yeah. And after like, I don't know, after five, 10 minutes of this, I was like, A, you need to take yourself for a walk around and pull back because this is insane. Like, shush, <laughs> take a time out. You are not adding value to these kids' experience right now. In fact, you're taking away from it because you're just you're just cranky, you know. And so I I walked myself around the pool deck and I passed hospitality. And there, you know, there was the coffee there, and I was like, go. <laughs> At this point, you need a performance enhancing drug. Like, <laughs> so I did. I got. I hate coffee, um, but I I had I sipped my cup of coffee. Yeah took five minutes to reconnect with the kids. And unfortunately, I was like a really amazing coach after that. I was nailing it. I was leveling people out. We were good. <laughs> I was like, I think I need to start drinking coffee. <laughs> well, do you like coffee now? Uh, I like the warmth of it. I don't necessarily like the flavor of it. Like I'm not a coffee person, but I mean, I'm out of the point where, I mean, I just, I, I tried to push too hard. And of course, I'm, I'm sure it's the same with you. Like that is a, also a, a fault in in the way that I attack the world. Like I I run as hard as I can until I fall on my face and bruise my knees. And then you know I, I find band-aids and get back up. And you would think it'd be like, okay, I'll run a little slower this time. No, I just take off again. <laughs> you know? yeah, so exactly. I I I think I'm getting I'm getting a little bit better at that with the with the long-term consistency but finding your pace i think is important and so i'm, I'm not i don't like to use coffee like that anymore but it was if i run too fast then yeah yeah i i i so my background um is a, a one of the things in my background i got a master's in applied positive psychology and part of that wow. is um they have a they have a framework in there a character strengths framework came up with by Christopher Peterson. It's it's filtered around in the world quite a bit, the 24 character strengths. So um, maybe maybe I'll send a test to you after we yeah. do this podcast because I'd be I'd be curious. Um, but I know in my top five there's like a, there's kind of like a a, a dedication stick to um, in there. There's enthusiasm. And then there's there's sort of hope and optimism. One of the ways I see that reflected um, in in what you're talking about is like when I'm in a really bad situation, I think that I can make it better through sheer effort. I just think like <laughs> if I just try a little bit harder, if I dig in a little deeper, like I can turn this around. And sometimes I can't. And sometimes I really cannot do that, and it's a disaster. <laughs> But I don't think that has ever changed for me. Like yeah. one, of, one of my first, um, I don't know, like a memory, but the, I think one of the first times I sort of just declared who I was in life was when I was five years old. And I remember this moment, my sister came home from ballet and there were auditions for the sound of music. And they were having all the little kids that would do ballet auditions for Gretel and Marta and all that stuff. And my mom says, is this something that you want to do? And she said, no, I don't really want to do that. And I said, I would like to do that. And my mom looked at me and she's like, <laughs> what? Like, why? What? You're five. Like, and I remember saying, and I remember it because it, 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 it was deep in me. And I said, please, mommy, just let me try. And I think that has been the always of me is, I just want to try. And, and in fact, that would be like when we talk about leading from values, that is the one thing that I'm asking for my, the culture of if, 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 if I'm the leader of the team and I'm going to aim the culture by modeling and encouraging in one direction, it would be that I'm asking my athletes and my parents to, try, to actually try. Just, it's a hard place to go to really actually try. There's, there's vulnerability there just oozing off of that space. But I think I've always been, 
ha, back to your point about optimism, I, I think I'm like stupidly optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> It's good to be stupidly optimistic. I, sometimes I call it, you know, sometimes I call it a rational confidence. I think everybody should have a rational confidence. I, I saw it in Denmark. People are um, generally culturally there. They're, they're very rational about what they can achieve. And I, I was trying to sort of shake them loose about it because it's, if you're actually doing yourself a disservice if you just sort of like, okay, I, I think I, you know, this is my box of stuff that I know I can do. Yeah. Right. You have to have a little bit of like, I think I can do that. And maybe it's completely outrageous what you think you can do. I, you know, for me, it's, it is so um, independent from outcome. It is, it is, I don't actually think I can do it. Like, it, actually, I would say that whether I can or can't is irrelevant to, to my track. Mm. It's completely, because I, I don't. Oftentimes, I'm not entirely sure that I can do what I want to try to do, but I will say that that, that question isn't actually a part of factoring in whether I want to try. It's try for the sake of try. It's because it's, it's, a, it's an expansion. It's a wonder. It's about wonder. And living in possibilities, to me, has really nothing to do with what's going to happen. Like, so like when you go into a race, there, I mean, there's no, you have to do everything before the time shows up. The, the entirety of your effort has to happen before you see your time, right. before you have some sort of outcome measure. And, and I don't know, maybe, maybe that's part of where I get this stance from is because the outcome is completely irrelevant to the trying and the intention and the effort that has to happen in that race. It's to me, it's, it's it and in swimming, swimming, we get so, I mean, we, we, because that's the number one thing we can measure that's so focused on the time and it's in many ways, uh, I don't say it's completely unimportant, but there's so many other factors that go into like, was that good or bad or somewhere in between than just like, I improved my time, my time was the same, or I, yeah. uh, my time was slower than I swam before in my life, you know? Yeah, just be upside down. Well, one of the things that I'm working on right now is the evaluation criteria for the kids and how that affects the group move-ups and the group yeah. criteria. Yeah, and systems. Yeah. This is another thing I want to talk to you about. Talk to me about some systems. Thank yeah, you. so this is really exciting. I love it because I... I um, so my master's is in um, educational measurement statistics. Oh, um, awesome. Can, yeah, it's so it's, useful for what you're doing. It is. It's so useful. And that's why I did it. I thought, and this was another part of like leveling up systems. So I actually did that before I did the Eastern Iron Swim Federation. So it was after I was coaching in another team. And again, at the other team, like there were some things that I did well, but again, there were some things that I didn't. And mm. I didn't, I don't like that. So, um, so this evaluation criteria helps you go to not, not only the objective data, the, the quantitative data, but there's qualitative data in there that's very real. Coachability, uh, swim IQ, maturity, readiness, like all, all the things that are constructs that we make up ourselves. So right. I decide what coachability is. I decide what those factors are. And, and as I define it, as you measure each of those um, subcategories of that, you can then have really rich conversations on how do I become more coachable? Right. Uh, it, it, it systematically, it moves it away from conversations like, well, you don't just don't like my kid or your personalities don't match or, or, or what have you. When you define and dig deep into some of this, the qualitative measurements that, and, and you can turn it into quantitative data. I mean, you do. So it's a one to 10 on this and it's a one to 10 on that. And Right. You know, average it out and we got a, a 6.5 on coachability. Okay, well, I, you know, I can use that now, but it has to be, it's not going to be grounded in something that you can actually take out a tape measure or a stopwatch and, and time or, 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 or find the distance of that. It's not like how far do they go underwater. I was reading an article the other day about the bricks and mortar of language and how the bricks are, you know, the, the vocabulary 
but the mortar is the structure that you put that together in. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's exactly what I'm doing in this evaluation criteria. Your bricks are your objective data with uh, how far they streamline, um, how much space is between their shoulders and their ears. You, know, you can do all this objective stuff. Yeah. But the mortar is what decisions do you make with your finite energy? That can be debated, but you, you know, so maybe I have a hundred yards. Right. So that's finite. The decision making, the enthusiasm, the grit, the, these, this is the mortar. And I think it's way more important mm -hmm. than the, there's so many talented swimmers. Out. There's so many swimmers that can do stuff. But the national team, they have mortar. The, the leaders in our community, it's that they have mortar, they have connection, they have creativity and the choices of how, I mean, they're doing poetry, like back to like the brick and mortar language, really good athletes are poets. Yeah. They have the same concrete tools, but they put it together in ways that create new possibilities. And that's circling back to evaluations. It's, it's, it's the qualitative stuff that I think really creates a culture. It, and it allows them to be artists with what they do. I, I, you know, they're not coming out with, I know how to streamline and I know how to, I don't know, hold pace. I know how to hold red. Okay, but there's artistry involved. There's creativity involved and there's, there's agency involved. And that's really important to me. So back on um, Eastern Iowa, we would talk about, are you a tomato or are you, are you a creature? And a tomato is, because <laughs> they're little kids, right? I got, I got, I got Yeah, no, that, it's great. Right? So, <laughs> I have a six-year-old at home, so this is a perfect, yeah. okay. actually she, yes. seven yesterday. So I started saying oh, seven. Yeah, so seven, this is a perfect analogy. I may, may be ripping this off at home later today. Yeah. So. Oh, please do. So, so as a coach, am, am I a gardener? Or am I like running the aquarium? So like a tomato has no agency and I'm making sure that there's context around their, their environment. So I'm writing the practice. I'm telling them what to do. I want fertile soil. I want to make sure it's, I'm gardening well. I'm taking the weeds out, you know, all the things that you would do as a gardener, but the tomato is only a factor of their soil and uh, of their context, their soil, their sunlight, the water, that they're getting the nutrients that they're getting. But a, a, a creature, and we, we like to see, like, are you a seahorse in the aquarium? Like, I still have to make sure the water's clean and fresh and that you're getting nutrients and all that stuff. But you can make a move in there, like go to the fresh water or, yeah. or go up to this, go down to this. You have choices in there. So don't just like be a tomato, be, be a creature, engage with your environment, be creative in there. And there are there are possibilities that, that you could create that nobody else has created before ever because in the moment of what's going on, there there's infinite choices. So yes. Go on. I, can, I can remember where I really learned this and, and a, a conversation that I had. I swam at a division three school in Maine, Colby College. Oh, um, yeah. You know, it was just built a magnificent 10 lane, 50 meter pool. I, I can't wait to go back and see um, uh, but then, uh, so that was sort of one level of swimming. And as a coach, um, pretty early on in my coaching career, I was, I ended up as an assistant coach at, at Georgia Tech. Mm -hmm. And I remember I came back for like the alumni meet at Colby college and my teammates, you know, who were really sort of into swimming were very curious. They were like, what are those kids like at Georgia Tech? Like, what's different about them? I said, you know, listen guys, they're, they're really not swimming more yards than us, like the practices, if you just look at them on paper, you go like, oh yeah, we did that. But what is happening in the context of those practice is very different from, from what we did. You know, um, um, these kids are first off, like remember when coach had to like yell at us to like get moving. I, I almost never have to ask these kids to get moving, in fact, very often I find myself reining somebody in, you know, and sort of redirecting where they're uh, putting some of their energy. Um, they all have their own way of swimming the practice and taking 
you know, as you say, like literally poetry, taking what's on the page and going, okay, this is how I can make that work for me, yeah. right? Even yeah. if this set is maybe not not uh, the set you would create in a lab for my physiology to get to the highest level, like they understand um, how to get it. And then, uh, you know, everybody comes to practice every day. Everybody's like early for practice every day in really sort of little basic things. Um, and it was, uh, so it was, it was definitely an eye opener uh, for me to have that experience. I want to ask some more, you know, talk about evaluation, talk about systems. I, I, I've heard that um, you're using a lot of different tools for communication among them, like we're podcasting right here. You're actually doing some podcasting internally. Talk to me about how you've developed tools that maybe uh, aren't being used in a lot of other places for internal communication. Uh, we we found out about our, our COVID situation like an hour out of the pool. We were in Wisconsin on the way to the Recplex. And, um, was this like uh, March, April? March 15th, yeah. Okay, yeah. So, about uh, the same time as everybody else. Yeah. Same time as everybody else. Every, yeah, the Thursday at like one o'clock when coaches in college were having their team meetings in the middle of practice, uh, right. you know, we, we got our, our notice. And some one of the parents called me that morning at like nine o'clock before we left. Are you sure this is happening? And I was like, I'm sure. Like it's the day of the meet. We're swimming our relay tonight. Right. And at one o'clock, the meet was canceled. So anyway, we turned around at an uh, at an exit on the freeway to go back home, and in the car on the way home is when I thought, I, how do I deliver what I'm trying to deliver in swimming without a pool? How do I do that? Yeah. And, and I thought about all the conversations, mortar conversations that I have to get the most out of the, the, the bricks, the tools that I have. And on the way home, I just started writing down conversations that I could have with them, which would then make the conversations that I have with them when we get back to the pool richer and deeper. And, you know, when you, when you come into a conversation and it's new to you, the topic is new to you, you see it differently. You have different questions. It's a very superficial level. But if you've had that richness of conversation before, and then you go try it, yeah. I, I just think you can get so much more out of it. So on the way home, I started, you know, going through things that I would want to talk to them about. And um, we started off with a a physiological place so that we could get dry land going. Right. I, I went away from that really quickly. I think I did like three or four where I wanted to help them set up what their dry land routine is, but, but I wanted agency. So I wanted them to know that these are ways that you can do these exercises that apply to this stuff. So it wasn't mm -hmm. like, you know, do some jumping jacks and then do 10 push ups and then do 10 squats and run around the block. I wanted them to look at some things that apply to making your streamline better or helping your ankles be more flexible or, you know, things that you need. And then take that, create something through the lens of what you then think you need. Like, what are you really good at? And what are you not so good at? I wanted them to think about that in terms of the, the videos. I, um, I would put out a video every day. So, so I, I would, do a video and then I would ask them questions in a Google form and the, the, excuse me, the answers would come in. <laughs> the answers would come in in a spreadsheet. And so I could see the whole team where they were, what were they understanding? What, what landed for them? What did not land for them? And so the next morning I would talk about their answers. I would clarify things that I thought I needed to clarify. I would go deeper if I thought we were close. And I would just make a note to go back to it, to, to kind of spiral back to it a different time. And then I would introduce the new lesson. And I would just, every day, that's what I would do is I would present something. It was kind of like, um, I mean, it's, it's what we do in practice is we present something, you see them do something with it, and then you process where you think they are. And then you present something that you think is gonna land based on what their understanding was. So I just did that every day for, I think there's like 
71 lessons. And wow. yeah, and I'm not, I'm not <laughs> quite done because there's there's a couple review things that I want to do. But um, I mean, we went into it. I, I like my, my little curriculum. I like yeah. it. We talked about airflow because, because water flow and, um, sure. and, and we talked about uh, the all blacks um, and sweeping the sheds. Um, we talked about, uh, I, I don't know, like there's so many things that we would have conversations on, on the pool deck that I wanted to come back and have it with, like I said, like with, with richness. So it's one of the things that I'll be doing here as well. Um, we're, I think the, the, the country is still a bit COVID-y, some more yeah. than others. <laughs> yeah. But I think this is something that applies to a not COVID context. Um, you know, we were, when we were talking about evaluations last night, there was a tenant on a meeting. And, you know, that, I love that group of parents because they really, and you are in that group of parents now. Oh man. You really want to create a good space for your kids and you really want to help them be successful so that they know that they can be successful. Yeah. And they then have optimism about yeah. things that they can do. And when they were talking about that, I thought, you know, the videos that I sent out for the curriculum that I established, if they saw that with the um, couple paragraphs of commentary, and it was clarified for them, you're educating parents just as much as you're educating swimmers and you're allowing them to have a rich conversation as rich as it can be between parents that maybe never even swam right? or never even did athletics. How do you help them be a part of, I mean, it is, it's a triad. It's parent, athlete, coach. You have to honor the fact that those parents are the ones that are guiding the culture it's if we have to align with them and they have to align with us in order to move forward for this kid. Right. And so parent education, even on the stuff that we do in the water, like what's a streamline and what are the muscles that are working? Why does this matter? Help them have a conversation with their kids. Don't, don't shut them out. They it's their kid. It's not your right. athlete, it's their kid. And, yeah. and I'm in a supporting role and helping both of them come through this sport and having both of them have a rich experience is important. So the, the, the podcasts and the, the videos and the, the education that we did, I think helped have rich conversations with the athlete at the pool. But I think it was also even, even more beneficial to bring parents into the conversation in a way that we could all just be on the same page and work together. There's a lot of power in that. All right, I have uh, I have a couple more questions, and then I, I always do a lightning round. Yeah. Oh no. <laughs> yes. Oh, got some great lightning I questions that. for you, for you I Megan. Um, uh, one of the things I'm really curious about is you change. You not only change jobs, but you you were were or are the owner of Eastern uh, Iowa Swim Federation. Are you still? Do you still own the team? As you now working in another place, or are we, we're we're restructuring that right now. Okay. Okay. Right. Yeah, I mean that's like I, I didn't even think about leaving it. It must be uh, just a whole other factor to leave a team where you're in that ownership uh, yeah. position I, as well. I mean, I I I set my life up pretty good in yeah. Iowa. I have pretty yeah. good things going. Um, I, <laughs> I just I bought a new house in January. It's uh, it's five acres oh, on. So you yeah. really weren't expecting to move uh, in in no. in less than a year. No. No, I. I it was this was not. You know, we talk about goals and possibilities. Yeah. I'm open to possibilities, but it did not. It was not. It, this was not a goal for me to go right. take over you know um swim back swim back or you know what what, what have you dynamo or um in or baltimore yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly i wasn't like jockeying for that and 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 doing things that would make myself attractive to that and preparing for something like that um so this this wasn't this wasn't an easy thing 
there was a lot of, there was a lot of factors involved in making this choice and I do think it's the best thing for me in terms of expanding and you know that's a value of mine is growing and having opportunities to level up and challenge myself and and expand and um this this came down there were a lot of factors but the opportunity for growth my personal and professional growth and the impact that i can have by doing a good job yeah. um, that's that's really what it came down to but no i wasn't i, I, I wasn't looking um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about, and I felt some obligation to sort of like set this up in the emails that we were exchanging before we ever talked is you're, you're on the board of, uh, ASCA. Um, and I don't know if you've gone back and read my ASCA criticisms, <laughs> part of me hopes not. Um, but let me just ask with, with an open mind. Um, what motivated you to get involved in the board of ASCO? What's that been like for you? I mean, it, probably this, the, the same things that you uh, have issues with, you know, but, um, I want to do well. I want to do well for the sport. To me, being on the ASCO board allows me to go into some healing mm. for, for the sport. Um, and it allows me to support um, a leadership organization that that knows that that, that's well aware. So you uh, feel like that's something that's changed at ASCA? Oh yes, oh yes, consciously, explicitly. Um, there is there's there's very real conversation around how to do well and how to right wrongs and how to actually serve and what mm -hmm. does service look like and how do we support and level up and, and be in service to coaches. Those are very genuine conversations and they are painted with history. And I feel like there's a lot of honesty. Yeah. Yeah. And so for me to have a voice in how we do well for coaches and for our sport, yes. I want to have a voice in how we do well and how we really genuinely lead. Yeah, I, one thing I'll say is I think um, I think this goes for all big swimming organizations because I, I you know as much as I've been critical of ASCO and critical of USA Swimming, um, and you know I hear from people internally like I have a very good friend of mine who's been on this podcast. He's got a very important position at USA Swimming. Sometimes when I write something critical of USA Swimming, he calls me up on the phone. He's like, "Listen, Chris, that's not fair because X, Y, Z." And I go, "Yeah, but why isn't your organization communicating that?" I didn't know any of those things, and now I'm finding out on it off the record in a back channel conversation. Um, so I hope. Because ASCA is a very, very influential organization. And I didn't realize the power of it, um, again, until I left the country uh, and realized that, that, you know, it's called the American Swim Coaches Association, but probably international coaches get more value from it uh, in many ways than American coaches. Because they, for yeah. them, if you're in a small country, like I, I was in a country where you could drive east to west in three hours. And, um, <laughs> It's probably smaller than Iowa. Uh, so, so you know, it, you can, of course, get sort of it locked in this tiny little bubble. Um, and big coaching organizations like this offer you the ability to interact with just this sort of really wide range um, of people. So I would love to see, um, especially if things really are changing, some, some communication come out. Uh, you know, if ASCA's values are changing, let's communicate those values. Um, I think that would make uh, a huge difference. Yeah, you know, communication is, um, it, it, you know, it's something that I'm, I'm dealing with here at SWIMAC where um, if I don't, I feel like right or wrong, some, sometimes very much wrong, if I don't have that buttoned up, evidenced, locked in and and deeply defensible yeah and it, and i don't really want to parade it out 
uh, <laughs> to a lot of church people. And, okay. and so the, the downfall with that is legitimate where people are wondering, are left wondering, like you or like, you know, anybody, um, what are you up to? Right. They fill in the gaps with whatever. They fill in the gaps. They fill yeah. in the gaps. And, and when, there, when there's a lack of trust, earned or not and they've got to fill in the gaps you might be I'm, I'm trying to be very mindful of what I bring out and the justification and defense of why I would do something but if it's not complete then um, it, it's hard to drop bits and pieces because then, then then that's not complete and so you know there's a give and take in what do we roll out on a large scale communication wise in any context, whether we're talking about ASCA or SWIMAC or USA Swimming and what conversations are in-house and where does trust come along the bridge of someone on the outside saying, you know what, I think she's probably working really hard and I think she's probably thinking about this in a way that I would, that I would agree with. Yeah. Or, you know, it, my goodness, they've screwed up for so long. They're <laughs> probably busy screwing something else up, you know. And I better jump in there. I better send an email. I better, I better say, hey, don't screw this up again, you know. And so it's like, right. ah. so th there, there, there is a give and take in terms of communication. But I, I get like being felt like you're in the dark. Like if your values are changing, tell me. And but there, ha if there's coming, if you're coming from a lack of trust, then I'm gonna have to also defend. How those values are changing and how the rubber's going to hit the road. Well, what if yeah. I'm not done? What if that's not in place and I'm somewhere yeah. along the line? It just gets a little mucky. All right, we're going to go to rapid fire. I think we need you for a whole second podcast, Megan, because <laughs> in my research, no, in my research for doing this, um, and again, people go read Megan's bio at Eastern Iowa Swimming Federation because you're going to realize that uh, she's maybe like the most accomplished business person in swimming. If you look at all the other stuff she's doing, we've only talked about the swimming stuff on this. Um, so we literally could have a no, whole other podcast about uh, Megan's business adventures. But um, you know, I like to keep these to an hour, so we're, we're coming up on the hour mark. Um, and uh, so we've got some, some rapid fire questions for you. Um, and you're just gonna, you know, you're just gonna try to uh, get to them as quickly as you possibly can. This, okay. this first one, what is, in your estimation, the most underrated place to go to a swim meet? And I know my answer, so. Oh, for heaven's sakes. Um, uh, hold on, okay. Okay, uh, Coleman Pool, Seattle, Washington. Uh, you have to pass a ferry dock and go a quarter mile on the beach to get to it. And there's plexiglass and whales and seals, and it's the best place I've ever had a swim meet in my whole life. <laughs> is it is it outdoors? Yes. Wow. You can see the Olympic Mountains, and you're you're literally on the water, and on the other side is a hill with trees. Oh man, yeah, yeah, that sounds pretty amazing. That's pretty awesome. Um, my my answer actually is uh, Indianapolis. I I was somebody who. Uh, I have to say I was, I, sometimes I call myself a coastal elite on this podcast. Um, you know, I grew up in Massachusetts, uh, and you know, I sort of treated the middle of the country as, as flyover country, you know, <laughs> and no, oh, I mean, uh, it's just, and I never thought that, uh, I would have an awesome time going to a swim meet in Indianapolis, but it's awesome. It's an awesome place to have a swim meet. Um, that's the fact that they have all the hotels and you can walk to the pool and wow. um, it's a beautiful area to a vibrant area in downtown to walk around and, and do things. I feel the same way about Omaha, Nebraska. I never expected I would love yeah. Omaha, um, but you know, I love going to Omaha. Uh, the Des Moines Y. I mean, yeah. the same thing. The hotels are attached. It's it's clean. It's bright. It's got windows. It's beautiful. If you, if you haven't been to a meet at the Des Moines Y, like for a tier pro series or whatever, that, it's an awesome place to have a meet. It's just right. Yeah. I've, I've still never been to Iowa because I never even, you know, I, I, I'm not a gambler, so I didn't uh, go over to Council <laughs> Bluffs when I was in Omaha or anything. Um, yeah. Okay. I guess there, I guess there is gambling. Corn <laughs> and gambling. Yeah. Um, 
what besides this you can't answer this podcast because that would be uh too yeah uh too i don't know i'd get too uncomfortable so what what's your favorite swimming podcast oh what's my favorite swimming podcast um okay it's not a swimming podcast it's Fine. the hammer media okay um they i uh, uh they just talk about being a good coach it's not a swimming podcast but it's a coaching podcast it's a coaching podcast yeah okay. and it's um you know i i really love the the swim slam for the the swimming and the personalities and um i mean they just make everything so fun but if i'm talking about learning mm. uh, it's that it's that hammer media podcast where they're, they're talking about coaching mostly in like track and field and strength and conditioning but for okay. me they're really talking about the the level of being a good coach and that's why that's my favorite podcast okay uh yeah my favorite god what's my favorite podcast i didn't think you're gonna have an answer for that so it's my okay. podcast we'll just skip okay here's a really important one okay how long is a lap in a swimming pool well a lap is a down and back because in oh, a lap you have god. a length is a down <laughs> uh you don't know how good it feels to hear that <laughs> i was coaching a definition a lap is it yeah, you have to get back to where you started, I right? Think I think if you dictionary looked up, I think you, we would be on the same page there. But how many people do you run into that think a lap is 25 yards? Like that's, a length. that's, that's right, a, that's a length. Right. You, oh, you've right. only <laughs> swum to the other end. Mathematically, we could agree that that is the length of the pool. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. I'm so relieved to hear your answer on that. Yeah. Um, and then finally, very important uh barbecue sauce Ooh. mustard based or vinegar based megan God, you know, you, why do you why do you got to be tough on me <laughs> well this vinegar. is i mean you live in north carolina now so i <laughs> right and so the, and i hear there's a carolina barbecue and there's a texas barbecue and there's there's something about louisiana happening um I mean, I'm asking this question. You could be a vegan or something. It would be like, I don't eat barbecue. I don't, but. I'm, not, I'm not. And I love okay. barbecue. My husband just got a smoker and um, oh. my life has changed. <laughs> oh, man. I'm so jealous. Okay. So good. Yeah. So I, I'm going to go with vinegar. I'm going to go with vinegar. What yeah. is Carolina barbecue, by the way? Is that it's vinegar. vinegar. Oh. Wait, well, is it vinegar? I, sometimes, I have no idea. Vinegar. Whichever one I put first in this. The North Carolina people are going to listen to the end of this podcast. They're going to go, neither of these people know. I know. I'm so sorry. I just got here. I barely leave the house except to go to the pool. <laughs> I lived in, uh, uh, unfortunately, I lived in Georgia. So I, that's not helpful. So the Georgia, I think, uh, lacks even, uh, you know, their own uh, definition on that stuff. Uh, yeah. I, it, all the North Carolina people uh, tweet at me if I got this wrong. I do. I will learn. I really, I, I will learn. I'll get there. No, we'll both. We'll both. We, yeah. we love barbecue. We're just not 100% sure what sauce is on. <laughs> they give me. I say thank you. Uh, yeah. Don't give me barbecue. Yeah. I'm not in judgment space. I'm in the gratitude space to yeah. say thank you for the barbecue and put it in my face. Yeah. Yes. Um, all right, Megan. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, I really appreciate all the answers and honesty and um, this uh, conversation. Uh, look forward to some more in the future. And uh, yeah, and thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. This has been really fun. And yes to part two. And yeah, there's uh, there's a lot out there in the swimming world. So I'm glad you're doing this podcast. It's great to listen to it. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>